Welcome to Founderline, the show where we answer your questions about startups. I'm your host, Joe Beninato. Thanks for joining us today. It's great to have you all with us. Our goal with Founderline is to provide a forum where startup founders and employees can get their questions answered by experienced entrepreneurs and investors. Maybe you're thinking about starting a company or you're working through an issue at your company. Maybe um, you're thinking about joining a startup and just want to ask some questions about what it's like working in a startup. Um, or maybe you work at a startup currently and you have some questions about what's going on at your company. Um, in any of those situations, if you have a question, we want to try and help you. You can reach us multiple ways. Uh, you can call in. This is a live show and we love telephone calls. Our number is 1-844-4-FOUNDER. That's 1-844-436-8633. Uh, you can email us. Uh, the email address is help at founderline.com. Uh, or you can tweet a question to uh, at founderline on Twitter. With that, let's get started with the show. Our guest today is Josh Elman, who's a partner at Greylock Partners. Josh is an old friend. We actually met uh, way back in uh, the late 90s, was it? Uh, when uh, Josh was an intern and a senior at Stanford uh, at a company called Kartoffelsoft. He's worked for some amazing companies, uh, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Zazzle, and Real Networks. Uh, he's one of the few guys I know who's been through more IPOs than I have, uh, which is an amazing accomplishment. He uh, currently sits on the boards of Medium, Jelly, and Smart Things. And Josh, welcome. Thank you for joining us on Founderline today. Joe, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So before we dive into questions, I usually like to spend a few minutes just giving people an idea about your background, uh, both as an operator as, and, and as an investor. Um, I think you know one of the things that uh, is most amazing to me is you've been able to work at some pretty iconic companies uh, over the last few years, uh, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, so tell us, like, how did you hear about those companies or how did you find those opportunities? I'm sure there are a lot of people who want to work at the next you know, company that's going to go public someday. How would you find those companies at that time? You know, that's a great question. You know, I'll, I'll start with LinkedIn, because when I joined LinkedIn, I think it was the, the earliest of entities. It was under 15 people. And I was in my first semester of business school, actually. This I is, remember. This is back in 2003. And uh, a really good friend of mine and I were debating on the stuff that we felt like would be the future. And we were hearing about Friendster and LinkedIn, this idea of, of social networking as a way to connect with people that you know. And once you have your relationships indexed, there's all kinds of information, whether it's people to date or people to meet or yeah. people that could hire you, kind of all, all were available once you started building these social networks. And so I was sitting there at business school. I fired off an email to both um, Friendster and LinkedIn, which were the two biggest ones at the time. Never got a response from Friendster. I fortunately did. Good news, I guess, right? <laughs> As it turns out. Turns out it worked out. Yeah. Back then, Friendster was the even bigger they were hot. one. Yeah. Um, but LinkedIn replied and they said, hey, like, we, we'd love to talk. I had done the same major at Stanford as Reed Hoffman, oh, who was great. the founder. I'd never met him, but it was a, I think it just showed up on my resume and that was a neat overlap. They responded back and said, sure, we'd love to meet you and talk about what you're doing. And, you know, I'd spent six years as a Windows engineer on Real Player before, and that was a, a pretty well known product 10 years ago, maybe yeah. not as much today. Yeah. So LinkedIn responded and said, hey, let, let's meet. And, and when I met Reed, I sat down with him for an hour and he described to me the vision for LinkedIn. And he described it as this platform. And he could tell a story of what the world would look like today, where once we were all connected, people would get jobs differently. They would find candidates differently. They would sell things differently. And I got so caught up in the vision that he was able to paint of the future. And then he was able to articulate a very clear path Hmm. that I couldn't do anything but, but help to work for him. So wow. the first is it was interesting, and lots of great companies that we hear about are interesting. But then when I really met Reed and heard his story, and I said, that sounds like a journey that I just couldn't wait to be on, that's how I signed up. And as I've looked at most of the other, you know, finding Facebook and Twitter, I joined Facebook was already in 2008 about 500 people. Twitter was about 80 people in 2009. Um, when I joined, they weren't quite as early, and they were fairly well known, so it wasn't how did you pick them, but once you get to know the team and you hear the story of what they still think it can become from the point it's at right now, and you hear this, this amazing world that you can't even imagine yet today, 
that's when I get really excited, and that's when I kind of get that extra conviction to go join them, as opposed to you know thinking it's a really interesting company, but not being ready to go commit myself to it. And and it's interesting. So that was a cold email, right? You you had never met him before, and, and back then you didn't really have LinkedIn to go like <laughs> look him up, right? So I mean, it was it yeah. was emerging. So uh, I mean, as a, I, I've heard and I've experienced this myself, countless stories about cold emailing and you you just never know who's going to respond on the other end of the line right it's no, uh, it was it was it was a, a pretty cold email um i think in in one case i was responding to a a job posting that had come across the symbolic systems board and i tried to explain i'm not actually looking for a job because i'm in business school but i would love to to help yeah but it was just being part of the right communities and looking for interesting things and and having a in what i've always said is i've always had a list of here's the companies i'm personally excited about that i think Looking at them today can be so much bigger in the future. And anytime I got an opportunity to meet somebody from one of those companies or get a chance to kind of hear their story, whether at an event or speaker, I'd always seek it. And, and so I got to learn more about those companies, you know, and that's actually what helped me move from LinkedIn to Zazzle to Facebook to Twitter. And I built kind of connections all along the way to help make those easier as well. Yep, no, that's great. And, uh, and then obviously the connection with Reed plays out when you transition over to Greylock. And, right. uh, and so, um, you know, a lot of people, I think, uh, are interested in the story of someone who's working as an operator and makes the transition to VC. So you're what, like uh, three, four years in now? Uh, two and a half. Two and a half, okay. Yeah. So, um, so how, how has that gone for you? You've, I mean, you've already made some pretty amazing investments, but uh, I'm sure there are up days and down days like anything else. Uh, tell, us, tell us a little bit about that. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll go back to kind of what it's the difference of being operator and being a VC. If you think about our careers in the Valley, either you're a founder or you're investing your time in the service of some founder in some company to help it become much bigger yeah. and more, you know, and do new things in the world that didn't exist. And that's the power that we have um, in the Valley is we get to create these things that don't exist in the world that then get much bigger and more mainstream. And I always spent my career trying to use, you know, my time to go find great opportunities where I could invest my time and help create something much bigger. So when when I left Twitter, I thought what would be, you know, I'd already been through kind of so much of the journey and you know when you're on these journeys, you're just in this boat and it's just so intense and yeah. you know you're kind of it's very exhausting even as an employee, let alone uh, you know what founders feel and experience. And so I thought I you know I I need a little bit of a break or I need to find something different because I'm really good at a certain stage of a company but might not be the best operator to scale it you know significantly larger maybe venture would be a place I could learn and use some of my strengths um, and really kind of help more companies be successful like I've done over my career so I thought of my career as I kind of was a VC with my time can I try to actually be a VC full time and you know, when I, when I talked to Reed and David and the folks at Greylock, they said, hey, we're kind of looking for somebody to come in as sort of an apprentice and see if it makes sense for you, see if it makes sense for us. Most likely, you know, you'll do this for a couple of years and you'll go back and get another job, but, you know, you never know. And when I came in, I thought, you know, there's a lot of parts of the job that fit me really well. And, you know, I was really able to, I, I think, add value to the Greylock team in the way that we made decisions. And though as we raised a new fund last fall, they invited me to, to join as a partner and it was kind of a, a, you know, in some ways a, a dream come true. And then instead of a really scary risk that now, you know, you can say, oh, wouldn't it be fun to be a VC? And now I'm like, oh, wait, now I actually have to find great companies, make the decision on investing, you know, get on great journeys. And you can never know which companies are ultimately going to be the winners, but you can pick the journeys you want to be on yep. and the people you want to work with and the ideas you want to go after. And, and I feel so lucky to have made a couple of investments that I couldn't be more excited about so far. Cool. Well, and we'll we'll talk about those. Um, so, uh, you know, three pretty high profile companies, right? Yeah. Medium, Jelly, Smart Things. Are those the three? Those are the three so far. Yep. So, um, you know, obviously some pretty amazing founders. I I, I know at least two of the three founders. Yep. Um, what what was it that set those companies apart? I mean, you see how, how many you see a hundred, two hundred companies for every company you fund. Maybe five hundred, a thousand. I don't know what the number is. Um, What's uh, last year? It was two hundred. Uh, we funded three and saw six hundred. Okay. That that I did. So. so what what sets those apart other than you know ebbs involved you know or wh whatever whatever it might be? Yeah. You know I think I think the first thing is what I said in the LinkedIn story. When you hear a story of what the world could look like if this idea comes to fruition, if it's successful, 
and you find somebody who's really articulate at saying, you know, here's what this vision could be. Now, you know, with, with both Medium and Jelly, you have cases where, where Ev and Biz, you know, have kind of been on some of these journeys themselves already, you know, you know multiple times. Yep. And so, you know, they're able to kind of articulate that sort of in a way that, that not the people are, because they've actually just been there and experienced it. But, but the journeys themselves are incredible. Like I've talked about the future of publishing and how print is changing and media is shifting and people still have so many ideas in their heads that they aren't able to express. And he talks about why, what he learned from Blogger and learned from Twitter and why he's got this unique angle on how it's gonna work. And, and you just think, you know, sure, Ev's amazing. And I, my time working for him at Twitter uh, when he was a CEO it was just a fabulous experience and I couldn't wait to do that again. But it wasn't just, I can't wait to work with him again. It was, I can't wait to work on this problem that he wants to solve and help him do that. Um, you know, and the same goes for, for Biz, talking about how that we're a connected society, being able to help each other creates an entirely new way of interacting. And that, that sort of jelly can be sort of this, this you know, network that really lets people help people. Yep. Awesome. Well, that's great. Um, so, you know, th given we're both like big product guys, right, I, I couldn't help but uh, ask you a few questions about some products. So this week, you know, we saw Facebook uh, release Slingshot and then this other thing called Yo, which I, I don't get at all. Yeah. So I'd love, I'd love to get your take on those. Uh, not, not that, you know, I want to want to slam anybody, but um, obviously two uh, pretty interesting new products, one out of nowhere and one like from a, a gorilla. So what, what's, what's your take so far? Well, I mean, uh, just to say a little bit of context, up until six years ago, pretty much all communication, you know, especially on phones, was was voice or simple text. And that was it. Yeah. Like, we didn't have data. We didn't have these ways to kind of explore all these different ways of communication. And I think over the past few years, first it moved on to, okay, it's like over the top texting, but it's still texting. And it was just text, but it was through data instead of through text, like WhatsApp. Yeah. You know, and then something like Snapchat comes along and says, actually, it's pictures, and it's pictures that go away. I think we're just at the beginning of testing. And then, you know, line, you see stickers. We're at the beginning of testing. All these incredible things you can now do, now that we're using data to communicate and message each other all the time. Yo is like the simplest possible form of that. Yo. And it sounds so silly, and in a way, it's just like poke. You used to it's be on the Facebook. It's poke, right? Right? And, and so, look, do I... Do I yet have conviction that it's got any chance to be an important or big company? Probably, no, I don't. Do I think though that it's testing and pushing sort of the simplest form of communication and letting us experiment yeah. in ways we couldn't before? Yeah, it's kind of neat and my phone's been going off all day and I hope to God in a week it never yo's again. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that's interesting. Look, and then Slingshot is trying to do the same kind of testing and experimenting with the fact that we have data in this kind of you know, connections between people. It's like, I'll show you yours if you show me mine. Right. Or uh, if I, I might have gotten that wrong. But, but, um, there, wasn't there a product that did that at one point? Uh, <laughs> I, think, I, I, I think it was a little on the pornographic side. I, I think but, there's uh, some more inappropriate. Yeah. Yeah. I'll yeah, show you mine yeah, if you show me yours. Yeah. Um, things, but, but again, it's just experimenting with these things. And, and, you know, none of them at first blush feel like the thing that will take off and become huge networks. But, Snapchat clearly has become a phenomenon, and you can't, you couldn't say, "Oh, look, the photo goes away." Ha ha, that's silly. Yeah, you know, yeah. you couldn't have forecast that from the first day we all experienced it either. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I, I saw on Twitter today someone was joking about the next app after Yo is like Sup, you know, or <laughs> exactly. something like that. So uh, we'll we'll see what happens. Uh, all right, well, great. We'll uh, maybe uh, maybe we'll try and uh, take some questions from people now. So. Um, once again, you know, we'd love to hear from you so we can uh, try and answer your questions. You can call us, one 4 founder uh, You can email us to help at founderline.com, and you can uh, tweet to at founderline, and we'll see if we can help you out. So um, let's get started here. Uh, I, got, I got some stuff coming in over the wire here. We have a tweet from, I think it's Cigar. Uh, what are the verticals you are most interested in exploring from an investment standpoint? Great question. You know, the areas that I get most excited about investing are things that, that and we talk about this a lot at Greylock, things that become large networks, platforms, or marketplaces of the future. And so we, we don't just think about the world in terms of vertical, but we think about like what areas can really become you know, very large sort of marketplaces and you know we really look to, to entrepreneurs to kind of guide us on where they see opportunity more than us targeting specific verticals 
But I'll give one example that Greylock recently invested in. My partner Simon Rothman led the deal in Sprig, mm -hmm. which was, you know, we are clearly seeing this shift in local transportation, local delivery, for people to be able to get access to things sort of at a moment's notice because we have mobile phones that can place orders, but also mobile phones on the delivery side that can help us do logistics in a completely new way. And Sprig came up with a concept to have food, uh, a very healthy meal ready for you in 15 minutes. And I think they've kind of proven how how if you, you know, look at the food vertical and think there's you know, billions or, or trillions of dollars spent on, on food and everybody needs to eat, can you reinvent that using those same kind of you know, logistics? And so we're looking constantly at you know, how much is communicating changing, how much is getting help. You know, I talked about Jelly getting help. And you know, new social platforms that can do this, as well as new things kind of that disrupt the city and the way that we live. You know, because we're in a fully mobile world. So it's not a specific vertical strategy that we go after as much as when we meet entrepreneurs going after a specific vertical or specific problem, does it look like something that can become a large network platform or marketplace ultimately? Awesome. Well, Cigar, hopefully that, uh, that helps you out. Um, we have an email here from Drew. Uh, how do you decide on valuations for your investments? Interesting question. I mean, in my experience, you know, it's so sometimes a little bit of give and take. But uh, and and I I don't I don't think he's specifically asking like what was medium valued yeah, yeah. at or whatever. But uh, so how's how's that typically go? Uh, you guys decide. They give you some hints. What, what's what's going on there? You know, I think I think valuation and an entire investment. You know, between you know, is a partnership between the investors who are coming in to help the founder with the company and, you know, the founder and the team and any previous investors. It's always a negotiation. You know, one part of raising financing is you kind of want to raise the most money that you need to get to your next major milestone at the least possible dilution, right? That's sure. the goal. And so, yep. you know, if you want to raise, um, you know, if you want to raise, if you think you need $10 million to get your company to a point at which it's obvious that you're producing significant revenue or it's obvious that you've cracked user growth. You know, you say, I want to raise $10 million. Well, the question is, how do you minimize dilution? And most investors want to take, you know, at an early stage, you know, around tw you know, 20 to 25 to 30% of a round because that's really the risk and the kind of partnership they're taking on. You know, as you show more traction, rounds tend to go kind of, you know, 15% or, you know, right. even, even lower than that. And so the question is how much money at the least possible dilution, because let's say you think you want $10 million, but it only takes you $3 million to actually get to that milestone. Well, that other $7 million would have been a lot cheaper when you raised it next time. Yep. So it's really this art of how much money do you think you need to get to the next milestone? I usually recommend then you double that. And then say, okay, that's my round. How much dilution am I willing to part with? And valuation stems from that rather than saying, I want to be worth $100 million. And do you, do you like... Uh go back and forth a little bit beforehand, you know, kind of feeling the entrepreneur out? Uh, or do they ever tell you, like, look, we're looking for five at 10 pre or, you know, whatever it is? Yeah, you know, I think, I think the best entrepreneurs kind of come in and say, you know, we're looking for, you know, they understand the stage they're at and that, you know, at a Series A, you're looking at, you know, 20 to 30%, you know, kind of for a new partner coming in, yep. at, you know, what you're looking for at Series B or C. And then they, they kind of come in with sort of a, and we think we need this much money to get to our next milestone. And you use that times kind of those expected assumptions yeah. to signal that. If you don't know what those are, talk to a, a founder. Talk to, you know, at, you can ask me and I can actually give you more specific numbers here right. um, of kind of what those target ranges are that investors assume so that you really have that clarity going in. No, that's great. I, I always tried to communicate it without communicating it. Yeah. So like we're raising three million bucks, right? Yeah. And you know, a, a VC in their head, they know exactly what that means depending on is this, you know, yeah. really early or, mi what, you know, what stage it's at. So uh, plus yeah. or minus. I mean, yeah, it's well, always... And, and actually, I realized that to be more specific, a seed round, you tend to think about 10 to 15 percent dilution. So if you're raising three at, you know, 10 percent dilution, that's at like, you know, a, a pretty hefty post. Yeah. Um, at a Series A round, you tend to think of 20 to 30 percent dilution. Right. At a Series B you know, 15 to 20% dilution at a Series C depends on what your milestones are, but it's anywhere from 10 to 20, you know, 10 to 15%, you know, and then, and then you kind of go on from there. All right. Makes sense. Um, let's go to, we have a, uh, email from Jerry. Uh, how does having a strong product background help you in picking a company to invest in? Good question. You know, it's a great question, Jerry. And, um, when I think about when I, when I think about um, you know products, you know, 
I've been in the trenches and I've understood kind of what it takes to kind of help build it and understand that, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. And in order <laughs> to see this, this, when I hear the entrepreneur talk about the idea and then see the product today, I can really dig in and ask them why they made a bunch of decisions they made in the product today. And remember back when we were making exactly those, the same decisions on most of the products I've worked on. And when I asked them, you know, where do you go from here? I really look for the founders can understand the step-by-step -step process of evolving a product. And I think I've been through that. So I can really relate and I can push them on, well, what if you did this instead of this first? How would that actually have implications on your product? We can get pretty immediately into a product discussion. That's something that I've, I've luckily gotten to have with amazing founders. I've helped them build some really great companies. And so I think that really just having been in the trenches, we can immediately jump into those kind of questions very deep on the product versus not necessarily having that empathy and exposure. And I think the product that you build is the center of almost every great company. Yeah. And so it really, we're gonna make our decision based on can you keep building a team and building a product that can, or a team that can build a product that becomes one of these iconic things. And if you can, then we get excited to back you. Hi. How do you handle, so when you're on the operating yeah. side, obviously if you th felt strongly about a feature yeah. or something, you could go make that happen, right? In, in many cases. Not really. Uh, well, <laughs> but whereas now, you know, you're sort of giving advice and maybe yeah. the founder thinks, no, no, we're gonna go in this direction. So how do you, how do you balance that uh, where you're not, you know, you're not in the front seat anymore, you're, you're you know, offering advice and guidance? Well, to be honest, as a product manager, I never felt like I was in the front seat. Oh, really? I mean, as a product Why manager, is that? Uh, because you're, st I always thought of it as like the guy in the back of the raft who kind of has the oar, who's sort of helping keep everything on course. But you have a team that has things and you have external parts of the company that have ideas and everybody else. And the goal is to get the raft to the, the right place on the river. And so I never really felt like I could just say, we should build this and everybody would build it. I was always coaching and listening and understanding what people's goals were and saying, okay, if we think that we want those goals, maybe we should be building it this way. And, and I was always much more in a position of influence than a position of, of sort of product as authoritative decider. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and even the best founders and the best CEOs that I've ever worked with, you know, have kind of the right level of, you know, we really want to go aim for this, but not you must do it this way. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I think, you know, as a, as a board member now, just as a, a friend of many companies, you know, I can help them and I, I give them advice and I, I really push back to like the core truths and the core data that you're going for. It's not about should the button be red or blue or should you do feature A or feature B, it's if you're going for this, do you believe that this is the right cadence or this is the right way to ship it or this is the right thing? And if you, if they do, then like you just have to support them in that decision. The, the question isn't, but, but you just wanna prevent people from making decisions that aren't really based on having tried to think through it all the way. Sounds good. All right, well, we've got um, another email here from Larry. Larry's uh, one of our regulars. We have, oh, re we have a regular now. Wow. So awesome. yeah, uh, what are the key factors that you look at in a management team when you're considering making an investment in a company? So the people, right? Yeah, so uh, you know, I, think, I think the team is one of the most fundamental uh, parts of, of when we make any investment decision because we're really more than betting on an idea or product or data or anything, we're betting on these people to figure out these pro you know, this set of problems to get to the opportunity that they've laid out. Yep. Um, so, so we look for a bunch of things. We look for passion. We look for a very unique fit with the idea that they're tackling. We look for humility. We look for them to really have a, an understanding of the things they know and the things they don't know and how, um, and, and we look for them being learners. We expect people who will, for areas that they don't know, they will both recognize they don't know them, they'll figure out how to learn voraciously and quickly, and they'll bring great people around the team to compliment them. At various stages, you need to have the people in the right seats who can you know, do the jobs properly. The, yep. the, the vice president of engineering at a five person company, it looks very, very different than at a 50, it looks very different than a 500 person company. And we look for you know, people who understand what the role and the scope is, and will constantly be learning to get to the next phase. Sounds great. Well, um, uh, we're almost halfway through, believe oh, it or not. Yeah, doesn't it fly by? So um, I'd like to take a minute now to thank our sponsors. So uh, this show wouldn't be possible without the help of our two amazing sponsors, Ustream and Auric. And I'd like to first uh, start off with Ustream. Uh, we met Brad uh, Hunstable uh, a while back and described to him what we were going to uh, try to do here with the live show uh, going out over the web and all the various flavors after that with podcasts and posting the videos online and he was really excited uh, 
He loved what we were doing. Uh, he put us in touch with the right people on his team, and they've been working with us ever since. And uh, especially in the last couple of weeks as we're getting ready to uh, take the show on the road over to Europe. Uh, it's been a little bit of a, a challenge to put together a TV studio in a box, as I call it, but, uh, but they, they've been great. If you're thinking about doing uh, you know, streaming an event or company meeting or whatever it might be, uh, go, go check it out. They, they really know what they're doing. Uh, it's ustream.tv is their website, and I'm sure uh, they'll help you out in the same way that they, they helped us out. Um, the other uh, company I'd like to thank is Auric. Uh, we work with Mitch Zookley and the team over there. And uh, Mitch and I have known each other for a long time. Uh, Auric uh, has done a great job for us. And you know, I always tell people when you're building a company, uh, your lawyer is one of your most important advisors, not just in the sense of giving you legal advice, but uh, really helping you out with decision making around financings or hirings or in some cases firings, whatever, whatever it might be, they've seen way more situations than you will ever see. And so having that, that knowledge and that guidance along the way is, is extremely beneficial. And, and you know, the legal stuff, of course, has to come along with that. But um, the advice is, is uh, you know, perhaps even more important. So if you're, uh, if you're thinking about uh, starting a company or you're looking for a great legal team, uh, go check out auric.com and uh, I'm sure they'll, uh, they'll be able to help you out. So um, with that, we, uh, we're gonna move on to our segment. We call it Ask the Lawyer. And uh, we're lucky enough to have uh, Mitch Zookley, who's the uh, CEO and chairman of Auric, who, uh, who joins us each week. So Mitch, are you, uh, are you with us today? Hey, thanks for uh, thanks for joining us, Mitch. So, um, uh, you know, we usually pick one legal topic and uh, go through it and get you know some thoughts from uh, from our guest as well. So, today uh, we're going to talk about consultants. Uh, you know, lots of startups hiring is really hard. Uh, sometimes there are specialists you need who can come in and help out with a specific role. You know, maybe it's a, a database person who really understands scaling, or maybe it's a, a marketing person who has a specific core expertise. And so, um, you know, we thought we'd talk a little bit about uh, some of the the business and the legal aspects. Um, so, so Mitch, maybe you could um, start us off just walking through some some best practices or. Um, keys to making these relationships with contractors work, and then we'll, uh, we'll get some uh, thoughts from Josh as well. You bet, Joe. So a lot of people are, are very surprised to learn that as a matter of law, the, the stuff that consultants do for a company is, owned by the co is not owned by the company, it's owned by the consultant. And that, that causes some real issues because the expectation is you should do a contract to, to really make clear that you own the IP that the consultant does for you. And you've got to go and make sure that you've got a written contract that goes ahead and assigns the IP to you. Yep. And so as a result, it's critically important early on to make sure that anything a consultant does for you, whether it's a marketing person, a web developer, a special coder, that you've got a written contract that assigns that IP over to the company. And it's really hard to go back and, and, and fix that later on. So it's, a, it's a, an important thing to do right up front. And, th and that's why those, uh, those proprietary uh, inventions and assignment agreement or what, what's it, PII something, A, uh, that's why those are so important. Um, so, so Josh, what, what's, what's been your experience? You probably hired and or, I don't know if you've yeah. been a consultant as well, but uh, um, what have you seen in those situations where you're bringing somebody on the team, maybe for you know, a couple of weeks or maybe for even longer? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think Mitch raised a really important point that when you're bringing somebody on, you wanna have very clear expectations of why you're bringing them on and what the value is. Sometimes you bring somebody on that you actually wanna hire and it's a bit of a trial period. But if so, structure an agreement clearly that kind of lays out your risks and expectations before you do that. Sometimes you bring somebody on because you have a project that you don't want to hire somebody full time for. And so you're really hiring somebody, you know, to kind of do this specific project for you, you know, and then be done. You know, make sure you set those expectations clearly up front. 
Sometimes you're, you want to go hire somebody, you can't. So somebody's like, well, I have a friend who can do this for you for a little while. And, and again, you want to be just very specific with that person, what expectations are. You're still looking for a full-time candidate. Because the places where I've seen people get in the most trouble is when the expectations aren't clear up front. And then six months later, the person's kind of still doing projects for you and work for you. And, and everybody in the company is like, does this person work for us or not? And they yeah, take yeah. Thursdays off or Wednesdays off. And so I think just like, Whenever you're going into one of these things that isn't a full-time employment, just make sure expectations are very, very clear, and then recheck those every month because it is a different type of, of arrangement than a normal employee. Well, and I, I go even further. Like when I see people doing this, I'm like, you got to write this stuff down. Even, even two founders starting a company, I'm like, you got to write down what you are expecting yeah. of each other, right? That, and a lot of people are like, oh, well, we're friends, you know, we, we, we can handle it, but. The, you know, someone says A and the other person hears B and next thing you know, they, they think they're auditioning for a full-time job and yeah. you're just like, you know, we just needed you for a month. Sorry about that. Um, so, so Mitch, uh, so, sounds like IP and just making sure if you do work for them, uh, that's important. Having clear expectations, you know, maybe with a little, even, even an email, it doesn't even have to be a fancy contract, but something that spells out, uh, you know, here's what you're gonna do for us, here's how you're gonna be compensated. Um, any, other, uh, any other suggestions as people are getting started with bringing contractors in? No, I think, I think that that's the core of it, Joe, and I think that you and Josh have exactly been right that you got to nail down those expectations up front in as clear a way as you possibly can. And you're also right, it doesn't have to be fancy. All right, great. Well, uh, sounds good. We're, we'll, uh, we'll let you go, Mitch. We'll, uh, we'll talk to you next week from, uh, from London. We're looking forward to it. Cheerio. <laughs> thanks, Mitch. So uh, that's, that's Mitch Zookley from Auric. Um, thanks, thanks again for joining us. Uh, if you have questions, we want to hear from you, call us, 844-4-FOUNDER, email to uh, help at founderline.com, or tweet to at founderline, and we'll see if we can help you out. So um, let's, uh, let's go back to the uh, inbox here and see what we've got cooking here. We have, um, we have another um, email from Bill. Uh, this says, what do you consider the ideal founding team in terms of engineers, designers, business people, et cetera? Might vary from company to company, but what, what sorts of things do you look for in the, in the founding teams? You know, I think uh, it's a great question about, about founding teams. The, the one neat part is if you have a great sort of founding team with a bunch of holes, you know that you'll be able to hire people and sort of build it up over time. So we don't look for completeness, but what we look for is, is you know, especially I, mean, I work in the, mostly in the consumer space. So, yep. so we look for one, you know, the right technologist who, as part of the team, will be able to actually you know, conceive and build and deliver a bunch of the ideas that, that, are, that, are, that are going to be created. Because I think everything we're building, it takes sort of, you know, the ability to kind of create something from scratch takes a very certain set of skills that, that a lot of people have. When you come in and we see, hey, I'm trying to, to build this thing, but I need to go hire some engineers. You know, I often find for myself that that's not quite the same um, you know, caliber of team until they get can go and kind of find and hustle and get great engineers yeah. and have to be partnering with them. Look, and then the second thing is, is someone who really has unique insight into how people think and how people react and passion for the idea they want to build. Sometimes that person's an incredible designer, sometimes they're, they're incredible at kind of striking business relationships with other people. Sometimes they are, um, you know, they're, they're like, oh, I don't really have any skills, like joke, but they clearly do around sort of product and articulating an experience. Hmm. But with that kind of product thinking and vision coupled with, you know, the right team who can go build that and make that happen, you end up with a great pair. Um, so we call that kind of, you know, a product slash business slash whatever person plus a technologist. Now, you know, Every team looks different, and sometimes that's all one person. Yeah. Sometimes that's three. Sometimes there's, uh, you know, we've obviously seen the power and importance of design. So beautiful designer who has a great sense of design, both as art but also as experience and utility. And, and these all make great combinations. And and there's no there's no set formula for you. Like if if may, maybe I guess if they're missing the technologist, right. that might be a little bit more of a challenge, right? Because finding that 
yeah. that CTO or whatever that that initial engineer is pretty hard to do if somebody just has an idea right and they yeah. come in uh, uh, but but uh, you know I, I think other areas you can frequently fill in uh, with with either contractors or maybe you guys I don't know do you guys have designers on staff or you know engineers who help out with certain things and you know as you're incubating companies or something like that you know you know um you know, as as we're doing that, we have a, a great network of people kind of around the Greylock community who we're always happy to introduce to kind of help founders kind of meet other great people to work with, you know, and do that. But it's really, you know, we really are trying to kind of put people together who work who work well. Look, one of the first skills of a founder, a founder is solving lots of um, very, very, very hard problems and tackling them one by one, really through the entire lifetime of the company's history. Every day. You know, and so, so being able to hire great people to work alongside you is just one of those many challenges along the way. Yep. No, it's, uh, I tell people it's, it's a, it's, it is a roller coaster and um, there are good days and bad days, yeah, right? And sure. good days, you knock off, you know, six or seven things that you needed to get done. Bad days, you know, you have setbacks, whether it's business challenges or people or whatever, yeah. uh, usually people. Lots of, lots of uh, especially in the early stages, lots of, uh, you know, hiring, yeah. trying to figure out right roles, all that sort of stuff. Um, so let's see, we, uh, we have a tweet from Norm I want to hear more about how Josh gets excited about an app and the friend test. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so I think I, I know. I, I'm sh sure you know Norm as yeah. well as I do. But uh, no, no, Norm's a good friend of mine, and he is subject to the friend test all the time, unfortunately. Oh yeah. You know. You know. Look, uh, most of the things that we that we try in the world, um, you know, they're they're interesting and they're different. And what I call the friend test is if two friends are sitting over lunch or coffee or just walking side by side, can one friend describe it in like 20 to 30 seconds? It gets the other friend so excited to want to try the product right now and think it's applicable for them. And, and that's really the base case of all virality and all distribution comes around. If I can convey to you why this is so interesting, I can incept it in your mind that you want this product, right. then, then I know it'll pass kind of all the other tests of distribution. You know, and so with every single product, I try to distill it down for, you should try this out because blah. And if there's something there that sounds good and most people go, I'd love to try that, then it's great. And if I, if I can't convey that, um, then, then I, I kind of struggle with like, what is the unique special sauce of this mm. product that, that's different? You know, I, I've taken this back to all the companies I've worked at, you know, and work with. And and so when you're thinking about making an investment, yeah. you actually do that friend test up front and oh, all see time. what see what happens. And uh, if you get a good result, that weighs more heavily in the company's favor. I mean, I think that's. I, I don't think it's even if it. We need it. We need it to be good enough that it's something that we can get excited about. Sort of, sort of sharing. All right. Well, Norm. Hopefully, uh, hopefully that helps you out. Thanks for. Uh, Thanks for tweeting in. And um, Norm gets the friend test all the time. Oh yeah. All right. Good. Uh, so we have a uh, we have an email from Tim. Uh, it says, "When you start a company, what is the ideal time to bring in a product manager? How much of a role should the product manager have?" That's a great question. I was actually the first product manager that that Reed um, hired, kind of after the founding team at LinkedIn, and I was the 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 first kind of consumer product manager that the early team brought in at Twitter. And so I've kind of been that sort of in that in that seat at different stages it, it, in the, it, it, both those companies, right? You know, it, it, it kind of the right time at both of those companies for them to really bring in more product managers. You know, both had a co-founder essentially who was sort of you know the product manager alongside. But look, at the end of the day, the founder is the first product manager. They're setting the vision for the product. They're, they're articulating what it should do, how it should work. They really have the eye to do that. And at a ten-person company, the pro, you know, the founder can kind of keep all the engineers focused and on task and. And, you know, with the, the head of engineering and other things and, and keep everybody going. As companies scale, you get to a point where the founder can't be in the trenches on all the details anymore because they're also fundraising or meeting with investors or meeting with potential partners or meeting with the press. And, and they get to a point where you actually want somebody who's in the seat, who's all the time kind of keeping the vision and making sure that we're addressing the right things and helping yeah. the founder realize their vision. And as you get to that, and I usually say it's around between 10 and 20 engineers is the time that you really want to have that sort of first product manager. 
and the company and, and the product manager starts to take responsibility from the founder to solve very certain problems that they can't pay attention to everything that's moving in the product. If you do it too early, you create sort of competition for like who do engineers listen to yep. you know, or the founder gets a little bit detached too quickly from the product and the engine. But if you do it too late, you know, with chaos where people don't know what they're working on. So I really think it's kind of somewhere between 10 and 20 engineers in the company is, is when you really want to have your sort of first product manager. But the first product manager has got to be a unique person who the founder really feels like they have a deep connection with. Yeah. The founder feels like we're going to, you know, mind meld on what we're trying to do. And I'm going to trust this person with the rest of the resources of this company to help them get it done and to help keep me in the loop as important decisions need to get made, as important changes, as you know, the founder still should be able to dive in at any time to help make things work and, and stay in complete lockstep with the team and the product manager. And the failure cases I've seen is when they get too far detached. Well, and that's that's an incredibly tricky hire. Having yeah. been, actually, I've been on both sides of that. and. Uh, uh, that that partnership really needs to work. I mean, if it if it's if it's not working, the thing blows apart pretty quickly. That's and right. it's also you know I I know as a as a founder who's sort of the initial product lead, it's it's a little bit hard to like let go, right? Yeah. Like you really got to trust this person. And uh, you you and I have never had the chance to do that together. But um, but you know you want somebody you can just go. I know you know we're gonna agree ninety plus percent of the time and. Uh, I know he's going to keep me up to date and, and let me know. And um, uh, what, what I always tried to do was um, maybe step back a little bit and have less frequent check-ins just to make yeah. sure, you know, you think it's where it's going. Because in some of those cases, you still haven't achieved product market fit. Right. And so you're trying to figure out, man, where do, where do we take this thing? How do we tweak it to get it, get it to work? So, um, so great, great question. And hopefully, uh, hopefully that helps a little bit. Um, Let's see, we've got another one um, from Carl. Uh, this, this one is an email. It says, uh, when a startup gets acquired, two products come together that should complement each other, and you get an injection of resources. Yet so often, innovation stops. What hurdles need to be overcome to keep innovating? How can this be corrected? Uh, an example, now that OpenTable has been acquired, how can Priceline spur innovation and get the most out of the investment? Pretty detailed question. So uh, it's a, a great question. We'll we'll talk at the generic and then and then Joe remind me if I don't quite cover open table and price line. Oh sure. Um, you know look, when a company gets acquired, what what's really happening is the company that had, that is getting acquired had a vision. They were going at it. They were trying to build something massive. They're deciding to join in support of this other bigger vision. Yeah. And so so the first thing that that often doesn't happen is I still believe in my vision and my vision must be successful for the product that got acquired. Whereas the first question is really, okay, what is the bigger vision here and how can everything we've built so far align and actually support that and amplify that? I think that's, that's, that's one challenge. Once you kind of embrace that, then you realize, hey, there's some things that were great about the original product built for that vision and some things that don't align with the newer, bigger vision that need to be changed. So if you look at, if you look at OpenTable and Priceline, there's a, a lot of synergy there. Priceline is now the place, I mean, bookings.com is a huge business. Priceline's a place where you go for hotels, rental cars, travel, et cetera. They're probably saying, hey, we already have you booking all of this kind of travel. How do we have you book more local events and local yep. types of travel? And say, so look, OpenTable is maybe the first part of how you, how you book that. What are the learnings that OpenTable has that are really unique about a local market that might apply that's slightly different in Priceline that was trying to get you more when you're traveling from your current home to somewhere else as opposed to just doing more things in your current home? And so I'm sure that they're going to, you know, both share and trade a lot of learnings. And I think Priceline will figure out when you're coming to Priceline.com, how do we change the product so that if you're looking for something local, you can now do that on Priceline when you couldn't before. All right. Hope that helps, Carl. Um, uh, once again, if you want to reach us, uh, you can call us one 844 founder You can email to help at founderline.com and you can tweet to at founderline. So um, we've got another uh, question here from Aaron. Uh, if an angel investor has more than a 1x preference, what implications does that have when raising a Series A? Hmm, that's interesting. So may maybe, maybe he's talking like on the seed side mm -hmm. and then when you get to the Series A. So uh, you guys put yeah. preferences in your uh, term sheets or no, uh, you don't? Um, uh, you know, I think, I think the trick with 
early stage finance, uh, financing at every stage is hard. And at one point you're always trying to find the right investor to align with. On the other side, like you really want to keep things simple. You want to have, you know, investors with clean terms and simple terms that, that make sure that, you know, as you do raise additional financing, you know, it doesn't create lots of complexity. How do we deal with all the individual, all the previous investors and all of their different levels and rates and, you know, preference stacks and everything else. So what I've often seen when a series A comes along is, you know, look, there are times where you might be desperate. And so an investor says, Hey, look, I'll give you some money now, but you know, I want, I want, you know, a bunch more money back, even if you just sell this company for, you know, a very small amount versus, you know, you know, just for the risk of the money yeah. that they're giving you. Yeah. Um, but when a really healthy series A happens, they often try to go clean all that up and, and just kind of reset all the different stock levels and just, just make it all feel normal. Cause at that point you're really fueling the company with quite a bit of capital to go and grow. So it's, it's, not a negative signal, but my, my guidance is as much as you can keep it simple, do that. But know that if you get to the stage where you have the right milestones for a good Series A, there's always a good chance to kind of help reset everything. And hopefully the angel is excited enough about the, the increased value and the increased capital to go achieve it. They'll be willing to do that. But what they're usually worried about is an acquisition or something that might come happen. Before that time, they want to make sure they have you know, value in case it doesn't go on to raise right. more money. Well, and there are ways to handle that as well, right? Yeah. To, you know, set something special up if there's a, a smaller acquisition right. or something right. like that. Um, okay, great. Um, thanks, Aaron. Uh, let's move on to, we have an email from Tom. It seems most of your investments have been later with established people or teams. Is that the sweet spot for you? So maybe asking if, you know, you do some seed stuff as well or... Uh, uh, and and most most recent one was that smart things is that right? Oh, Jelly was most recent. Oh, Jelly was most recent. Okay, so later stages, you know, some superstar founders in yeah. a couple of cases. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest, in Jelly, we we invested before it launched. Okay. So so you know, in terms of stage, it was pretty early. In terms of my relationship with Biz, it was it was you know somebody I just knew and trusted, and knew that that no matter when they launched, like it wasn't going to go gangbusters immediately, but that the team was going to be able to build something compelling for users. You know, I, I thought the product was great in the beta period. So to see how they'd kind of bring it out to users, learn, watch people engage and continue to evolve the product in a meaningful way. You know, we're a billion dollar fund. So our, our you know, model is to tend to be at the kind of series A and series B level, less, you know, rather than the seed level, because we're really looking to own sort of meaningful stakes of companies, often put you know, a reasonable amount of money to work that you know, if we're all successful in building a great company, it would be a great return and a, a great you know, result and a great outcome and a great sort of continuing of the vision for the founders you know, and a great return for us, as opposed to very early that I think there's a great ecosystem now of early stage angels and you know, smaller VC funds yep. um, that, that are great to kind of help you get from sort of zero to something. Sounds good. So, um, and, and the next question is somewhat related to that. It's an email from Claire. Uh, do you look closely at investing in companies coming from incubators and accelerators like 500 Startups and Y Combinator? So it sounds like maybe a little bit later down the road, but uh, you probably still yeah. look at a bunch of them to begin with. Well, you know, we, um, we believe in kind of building long-term relationships. All the investments I've done, the, min you know, the minimum with smart things I've known, you know, the founders for over a year before we actually invested and so when the companies are coming out of these accelerators and are really starting kind of on their journey and are coming out and are, are just beginning to kind of find product market fit, I love to meet them early and get to know them and get to see them some demo because then as we build a relationship, there will become a point at which they'll be raising financing that will be kind of the round that's sort of our sweet spot. And then it's a case where we have a, a built-in history. We've had some interactions. We've understood it. If I only meet you the week before you're trying to close financing, yep. the ability for me to decide if this is somebody I want to now go spend the next 10 years working together on something is much, much harder. And, and, and you know, I don't want to say it's impossible, but it feels impossible to me right now, and it's not something that I've done, versus building a continued relationship over time, talking about the product, understanding how you think. So, so like obviously with Evan Biz, you knew them because you worked together. Yes. With Smart Things, um, what was that a, you know, you saw it at the seed stage, or you saw it very early. You know, you met somebody at a conference or something, yeah. or what? You know, the, the founder and I first met at a conference called Founders, 
um, over in uh, uh, this are, is this is in Dublin. Okay, and uh, you know we were standing in the back of a church, and a friend said, "Oh, you should meet Alex. He's working on something neat in the connected home space." And he started describing me his vision, and I was immediately captivated by his passion and his insight into kind of what the future of the connected home could be, and, and how they were trying to tackle it. And, and then what happened is, you know, he said, look, I'm thinking about raising some money, you know, in the next couple of months. I said, great. Like, next time you're out in the Bay Area, he actually lives in Washington, D.C. Next time you're in the Bay Area, come and visit. And, and we'll just get together and talk about this more because you only have so much conversation when there's, like, a choir singing and everything else. <laughs> um, and, and so we did that. And then, you know, and then a couple months later, he said, look, I, I'm really thinking about raising fin financing seriously now. Let's talk. We got on the phone. We came and had a couple more meetings. At that moment, we decided it still wasn't quite a fit for us and wasn't quite ready. Um, you know, he raised a little bit of money then. Come the summertime, he said, look, I'm out in the Bay Area. I'm doing some business meetings. Why don't we catch up? We caught up. We were at another conference together, and we shared a car ride and continued talking. And then, and then I was starting to go, I think he's close to something that I really want to be a part of. And came back and said, look, I, I'm really going to go raise a round now. I'm talking to these five investors, and this is where I'm at. And I said, I'd love to be part of that set. And we sat down, we had some really good conversations. We brought it in to meet you know, more and more of the partners at Greylocks. We got to know all of us over time. And, and then at that point, we decided to invest. But it wasn't, Rome wasn't built in a day. Hey, look at my pitch. Awesome, here's a check. It was, it was very much this relationship built over time when he was you know, doing meetings, when he was out in the Bay Area, and, and it became something that you know, the past year has been amazing working with him. And that, you said his name is Alex, Alex is that right? yeah. See, see I, I think that's a great story because um, a lot of people don't realize you, you have to plant these seeds like yeah. well in advance, right? And, and so, you know, he, I don't know if he had this hidden agenda when he was at <laughs> Founders, yeah. like, hey, I got to talk to Josh or, you know, whatever. But, but I always tell people like networking is so important and like getting to meet people yeah. and, and trying to, uh, just trying to make a connection and, you know, over time, maybe they fall in love with what you're working on and maybe they don't. Um, but, but at least, uh, you know, it's a great illustration of that. That was over a year, right? Or around about, a year. About a year. Yeah. Well, and, and I'll flip it and I'll say, look, what we're signing up to do is not six months or a year. We're signing up to spend the next 10 years together building a company. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's, people say it's like a marriage, but it's even harder to divorce from a financing and a board member and an uh, investment in shared ownership of a company yeah. than it is almost any other type of, of relationship. And so, so you really want to know when you're getting in business together that you're going to enjoy working together and trust each other and build that. And, all, you know, um, my partner, David Z, uh, who, who I think has been one of the greatest venture capitalists of the past you know, 10 or 15 years, uh, he, said, he said very well, he said, it's like a relationship except people rush through the dating process obsess about the wedding, which is like the term sheet and evaluation, right. and they totally forget that there's a whole marriage that follows over the next 10 years. And he says, when you flip it and you think only about the marriage, and you think about how the dating gets you to a wedding that, that you know, is a day, but a day only in the life of the long-term marriage of the company and setting yourself up for true partnership, um, you're really gonna end up with a much healthier and you know, yeah, hopefully that's much more advice. successful. That's great. Um, well, we have time for one last question. Um, uh, this one was sent in anonymously. Uh, it is, uh, our primary seed investor is a traditional VC who invested 250K out of 1 million in our first round. They seem to be souring on our space and company. How important will that be when we go to raise our next round of funding? If they don't lead the round, will that cause issues for us? So this yeah. is the classic, uh, what's the term, signaling? signaling risk, yeah. yeah, so um, I don't know, you guys don't do like we, early seeds. We have done a little bit through our discovery fund. Okay. You know, there, there's two answers to this question. The, the, the first one is, the neat part about financing is like dating. Like you only need one. Like you've seen, <laughs> you've seen one investor at one stage to, to, um, uh, to, to, to lean in and lead you around, just like you only need you know, you know, one partner to choose you, just that you want to choose to have a really healthy marriage. Um, the other part is, is just being really open about why that is. If I meet you and you're like, you know, and, and you have some large traditional VC on your cap table and I say, oh, you know, what are their thoughts about it? Look, they soured on the market. They still think we're great, you know, they're supporters, but I'm not sure I really want to work with them anyway. I'm looking for another partner. It's a great answer. And in fact, if I call up that person and they say, look, we really like you know, Joe, but we just don't feel like this is gonna be a fit for us right now, 
then that's fine. And I, you know, assume most investors and VCs know each other, so they're likely to make that call. Yeah. You know, yeah. but if I call the investor friend who's like, oh my God, we put some money in and the person lied to us and it just didn't make sense at all and it's a disaster. ended up doing something else, like that's a terrible reference that'll really hurt you. So look, if you're open and says, look, this is what they're gonna say, and then I call the person and that's what they say, and it really is just they soured, but I get excited about the idea. You know, my I'm not invest you know, I'm not gonna be right if I only invest in what other people think. If somebody else sours on it but I believe in it, like that's <laughs> then like that's opportunity. Yeah. Um, so Yeah. No, those are those are tough situations yeah. and uh, you know, you're always trying to figure out uh, how do I package this in the best possible light? No, just be open and honest. Like, there yeah, is, like yeah. the reality is being open and honest actually gets you through, through, through all of it. If you know what the person's going to say and you had a good conversation with them, and then you say that to me and then it gets referenced and then I still love your idea and I want to actually sign up and do it, then it's a, it's a win-win. Yeah. Well, and, and I think a lot of people forget you are going to call, you know, yeah. whoever that is. Right. right? And so, um, so one way or another, you gotta make sure that your relationship with that person, even if they don't like what you're doing, it, that yeah. is still, it's still okay. Gotcha. Even, even if it's not, you know, what you had hoped it would have been, um, that, that you're, you know, still uh, working with them effectively. Yeah. And there, there's, there's still gonna be an investor in your company, even if they aren't That's leading right. the Series B or the A or what, you know, whatever it is. Exactly right. So, um, well, great. Well, uh, we're out of time. So uh, I know it flies by, right? Really so fast. thank you for being such a great guest. Uh, great, great answers. And um, you can follow Josh on Twitter. Uh, his handle is at Josh Elman. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I've uh, enjoyed my, uh, my friendship with Josh over the years. And if you're looking to go build a company, uh, you should definitely go talk to him. So um, uh, tune in next week for another episode of Founderline. We'll have a special Wednesday edition uh, live from London. And our guest is going to be Roberto Bonanzinga from uh, Balderton Capital. Roberto is another um, old friend who used to work here in the, in the Bay Area and then moved back to Europe. Um, great guy, very plugged into the um, consumer internet world in Europe, and, uh, and also he's done some investing here in the U.S. as well. So um, uh, it'd be great to uh, learn more about what's going on over in Europe. Uh, they will be uh, next Wednesday at 10 a.m. Pacific time and 6 p.m. London time. So we hope you, uh, you join us for that. Thank you once again to our uh, fantastic sponsors, Auric and Ustream. Uh, don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at Founderline. Um, and during the week, if you want to email questions in advance for Roberto, you can tweet or you can uh, email to help at Founderline.com. Uh, you can also go to our website and subscribe to updates. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll keep you up to date on upcoming episodes and uh, when videos get, get posted up to the web. Uh, you can also subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Thanks for watching, everybody. Here's to the crazy ones, and we'll see you again uh, next week from London.